Hello and welcome back to Ride Revival. On the last episode, I uh, took on everybody on a wild ride buying uh, a 1964 Buick Skylark convertible on eBay. And kind of went over the, the lies and tortures <laughs> that I had to go through to get that car home. Uh, but got it home safely. Um, so one of the first things I did once I got it home was to, to get it safe. Uh, replace the headlights and then when it came to the windshield wipers, uh, the windshield wiper motor come to find out was rusted solid for work. So I found a, uh, another windshield wiper motor on eBay for 20 bucks that was used, uh, cleaned up like brand new and uh, was able to get uh, the windshield wipers to work correctly. To start with, knowing that at least the car was safe as long as I was um, not getting on any mountain roads, overheating the brakes, uh, then uh, I was able to take it to quite a few car shows and was pretty successful with it. Um, it did open up a lot of conversations, even with the crazy wheels uh, and tires, but it was actually a conversation piece. It would get people talking and then I could talk about the things that I wanted to do to the car and, and uh, get people's advice on what I should do with the car. After taking the car to several car shows that, that first summer that I owned the car, um, you start seeing the same people over and over and over. So I was wanting to make some changes to the car uh, to get some new conversation going because going to the car shows became a point where people were avoiding me. <laughs> they were, it's like, oh, there's that sales guy. There's that guy that sells insurance and they would turn and, and run away. So by making changes to the car, or making changes to the conversation, I wasn't out there trying to push and solicit. I was hoping to just become friendly, make friends talking about classic cars, and then hopefully they would give my phone number out to people that would be interested, which ended up working out. So then it came back to, okay, the next season, I wanted to make some changes, and that's when I met a guy um, that worked for a hot rod shop. He was hoping that I would put an air ride suspension system in my car and then we could solicit and sell air suspension systems through the hot rod shop. And he talked me into coming to work for him. Um, so that was one of the first things we did. Um, I, I wanted to change the wheels and tires right away so I had been looking for a, another set. One of the car shows that I attended with my car, uh, there was a booth there for Coy's Wheels. Coy's Wheels was a new manufacturer and they were manufacturing not too far from where I lived. The uh, classic car wheels that they had there, they had a display with a GTO that had these wheels and they were exactly the wheels that I had in mind for my car. And after I got talking to them, they were telling me about the wheels and tires that were on the GTO and they said that they were just a display set that they'd used on other cars and that um, this particular GTO, they're going to go back to the original wheels and tires and those tires and wheels were available. And they're only a thousand dollars. So I made an appointment to bring my car over to their shop. Uh, we tried the wheels out on my car and um, because it fit the GTO, it's the same body platform as mine. It was a perfect fit for my car too. Uh, I wanted the car to be able to be lower down onto the ground with the air suspension that we're looking at doing. and. Uh, those tires were tight. They rubbed a little bit on the front and they rubbed a little bit on the back, but got the full travel and the suspension and everything set up with the air ride suspension. I knew I was gonna have to modify the wheel wells a little bit and maybe push the fender wells out just a little, um, but it was something that would be easy to do at the shop once we had it up on the rack. So now that I have the wheels and tires, I need to get the air ride suspension uh, shop that I worked for. Um, they wanted to do something that was at full travel. Um, all four wheels were independent in the suspension. Um, they wanted to be able to sell computer systems and self-leveling systems and all kinds of sensors, all the bells and whistles on my car so that they could take it to shows and then show off what you can do with the full um, air ride system. So once I ordered the system, once we started sorting through all the parts, we decided, well, let's just start in the rear of the car. It was just a matter of taking out the original springs that was in the rear end of the car and putting in the airbag. At the base of the spring, it had a plate uh, for the spring itself. Um, Universal Air had a plate that we could use 
that bolted to the bottom of the airbag and also bolted to that original plate. So that was an easy fix. So it had a metal cone <clears throat> that mounted to the top of the airbag and it had a metal plate on the top of that that could be mounted to the frame. So the way it worked out on my car, that cone slid in there perfectly and we could get to the inside of the, of the cone and weld it to the frame and gave us access to be able to get down into the top and bolt the airbag in on that plate we welded. Uh, put in an attachment for the airline for the hose to come up through to the valves and we were done we were in. Uh, we didn't have to relocate any of the shocks. The shocks were able to stay in their original position and then it was just a matter of, of hooking up the valves. So then we moved to the front. So the front airbags, to be able to place those in place of the spring, we had to relocate the shock. Uh, the shock runs through the spring on that particular suspension. Uh, so if I was to do it again, I would buy a shock wave. That was, that's the shock with the airbag right over top of it. Much simpler switch. But I was getting these parts for a fraction of the cost. So with that particular type of bag that you can see in the photo, the lower bottom end of that bag had a bolt plate. And so for that to sit down inside of the spring cradle that's in the lower arm, that had to be changed. So we welded a plate, a heavy duty plate on the top of that lower A arm, and then that bag was able to bolt to that. Worked out great. Um, the bottom of the, the spring perch that hung down, cut that off and welded that in and ended up with a plate top and bottom. Um, it really stiffened up those lower arms so it would perform and handle much better than the way it was originally set up for, for a spring. Now the upper end of the bag, where the bag would go up into the frame, that pocket was fairly narrow for, for the original spring. The airbag itself would need a little bit more room so that it didn't rub. So we had to go in with a, uh, a torch and cut away part of that frame and then grind it smooth. It wasn't much, but it was just enough that um, it wasn't going to damage the rigidity or the strength of the frame, but still have a lot of movement for the bag and not rub on anything. But right next to that opening was a bump stop bracket for the lower control arm to come up and hit if the car was to bottom out. I had to remove that because that was going to rub on the bag. So that was relocated. So if there was a catastrophic failure in the air ride system, the car would rest on the bump stops and the lower perch for the engine cradle of the frame would be about an inch and a half off the ground. So I could safely get this car to a stop without throwing sparks or losing control no tires would be rubbing on the wheel wells um, and it would be safe to drive and that's the key. You want to make sure everything is safe. I've seen some really hokey crazy air suspensions that people have done in their backyards and they didn't really think out what would happen if something goes wrong if everything fails. So definitely something to think about. In my car when it was all the way down on the bump stops my tires because of the size of the tire that we ended up putting in it, my tires would rub the fender wells. So I had to modify the front fender wells. The rear fender wells rubbed just slightly on both sides, inside and outside. So that would have to be modified too. But in the interim, to be able to enjoy the car, if I did have a catastrophic failure, it was so minor, the rubbing, that it might burn the paint a little bit, but it wasn't going to cause any major issue. Universal Air provided a five gallon tank um, for storing the air. Um, they taught me into going with three eighths lines. And then um, there's valves for all four corners of the car. It was a, a valve to go up and a valve to go down. So there was eight valves total. And then we did a Dakota Digital uh, computer system. Uh, the Dakota Digital uh, was just a little box that fit perfectly in my ashtray. So that, that was exciting. I wanted to be able to hide it. I didn't want a box sitting on the seat or on the console because I've seen that at the car shows and the switches and everything. And that's similar to what the hydraulic system is. But uh, mine was able to just 
go into the ashtray and you could close it and hide it and open it and there was all the full features. Well, the Dakota Digital, um, it had three buttons on the left side of the window and then it had the full range of buttons on the other side, which was um, all four corners of the car. And of the four corners of the car, you could I could activate the, the both front at the same time, I could do both rear at the same time, I could push it so that all of them activated at once or independently on each corner. Um, so of the three buttons on the one side, I could hit all the way down, I could hit a set height that I wanted as a drive height, and then I could hit a set height for all the way up. Uh, the way the sensors worked, uh, the sensors had an action on it um, that was an arm that you would attach a bracket to the rear end or one corner of the suspension and it would mount to the frame and with the full travel of that arm all the way up would mean the car is all the way down that would you'd set the computer that is zero all the way up which is the arm all the way down reset it again and it would set the, the computer system to 100 percent up so that was zero to 100 was the full travel of each corner of the car. And the more action you could get out of those arms, the more accurate the suspension was. So it was key to get them placed just right and get the right length of the arm and get the right action of the attachments so that the, the car, the computer could sense the corners of the car and be able to, to work everything properly. In addition to the computer system, the way it was set up is if I push one of those three buttons, so let's say I push the button in the middle and I program it so that on the freeway it is driving at a certain height, uh, that would be the smoothest setting for most road feels uh, without having to worry about any big major bumps or chuckles or, or going through gutters or anything that way. The highest button then I could set for a running around town where you are having to worry more about road hazards you need to have a higher ground clearance for things to straddle to go underneath the car, as well as getting through curbs and around corners and um, speed bumps and the like so we're not dragging the belly of the car. So those were the settings that I had. And then when I could go to a car show, I could hit the bottom button and it just drops all the way to the ground. Um, so that worked out wonderful. And then the individual corners on the opposite side of that controller, if I push the, the middle button for my ride height, Sometimes it would come up and it would adjust and it would leave one corner just slightly higher or lower. And in the window, it would give me the indication of how high the car was. So if I set the car for 30% for all four corners, then I would see a 30, 30, 30, 30 in the window. Um, so it was a great system. Once in a while, for some reason, the driver's side corner would always lag and it was probably my weight and the battery in the corner and other things that just the pressure that the car was sensing didn't quite get that one corner up. It was always around 26, 27% where the other three were at 30. So I typically just have to bump that one up and I could just tap that in and bring the corner up. And in addition to having that automatically sense the height of the car, the right height through the three settings, about every five minutes, the computer system would check the sensors and make sure the car was sitting level. So if you did have a slow leak or if the weight distribution is shifted in the trunk or something that way, it would reset itself and it would re-level itself up. It would give little bursts of spurts of air and it would raise or lower the car. Well, the system that they, the guys at the shop talked me into, they wanted to have a lot of activity. They wanted to really show this car off. When they had this thing air up, it would go bang and come up like hydraulics. And when you aired it out, it would go bang and drop on the ground. They wanted a lot of action. They wanted a wow factor to just really get people's attention. It was not fun to drive that way. Um, in order for the car to go down gradual and smooth, each valve had a filter that you could put in the valve that would filter the air and gradually lower the car down. To be safe, that's a must. You want the car to go lower nice and smooth because if you were on the freeway and there was a catastrophic failure, you're gonna lose control of the car. 
especially if you just lose one corner. Um, if you have a catastrophic failure and the whole thing drops on the ground, if it drops sudden and fast, uh, you can throw sparks, um, you could lose traction on a wheel, and that's not safe either. But for taking it to a car show and showing off these drastic reactions, um, it, it did its job. It did draw attention. Uh, so I got the filters, um, so I had everything set up inside of the trunk where I could take the filters out. When I go to a show and show it off, I could just twist those filters back in with a wrench and then I would be safe again. So in addition to being able to make the car react quickly with a large diameter line to flow a lot of air, it had to have a lot of pressure. So the Viair system pump that um, Universal Air provided with my setup um, was a constant um, on demand type of a pump where it could run nonstop and not burn up. Some of them, they can only run at a certain amount of time and then they're gonna shut off. So for this system, I needed something that could run continuous. So the way the system was set up, when you first turned the system on, the air compressor would come on and would bring the pressure all the way up to 200 PSI. And then it would shut itself off. Now once you used or activated the airbags, let's say I've got the car sitting in the shop and it's all the way bagged out sitting on the ground, and little by little over about a week all the air pressure would leak out of the system, it would take about 10 minutes to bring that air pressure all the way up to 200 PSI. Hit the button, the car would jump up to ride height, and the air system, once the pressure in the car dropped below 165, then the pump would kick back on again. That always kept the air pressure inside of that tank between 165 and 200 PSI. Well, with that large diameter tubing, and 165 to 200 PSI, it was violent when that car jumped up. It, it, it hurt, it would hurt your back, it would hurt your neck. The car moved way too drastically. For showing off purposes, it was great. People loved it. It was frightening how hard it would jump up. It would jump up pretty close to what hydraulics would do. It wouldn't pop the tires off the ground or make the front end hop like you could with hydraulics, but it was close. Uh, now keep in mind, you take that violent reaction and you're going down the freeway and the computer system kicks on and wants to level the car out, it starts to dance. It was, it was not a good situation when it came to driving. So for me to drive the car, I would have to remember to shut that feature off. The controller on my ashtray, I could open that up and hit the buttons so that I could manually control each corner of the car and I could shut off the computer system from automatically sensing the car while I drove. It was the only way to drive it. To get on the freeway and have that start trying to adjust if I was going around the corner at a high rate of speed, I could probably lose control of the car. So there was some features about that that was for showing off, but it was terrible for driving. So I would not recommend doing a large diameter line and the high pressure sensors that was in the car. The full system for my car at wholesale cost and all the parts was $3,200. So that was a, a big cost to me when I've got a car that's on a budget, I'm trying to get a business started with insurance. It was a big leap of faith for me to put all of that into my car and have the shop, luckily they put in all the labor, but I didn't sell any. The key was is that for every system that I sold for the shop, the shop was going to reimburse me for the parts that went into my car. The shop went out of business. I didn't get anything back. So now I've got a car with a air suspension that is way too active for my driving and what I'm planning on doing with the car. So I had to go back and make a lot of changes to tune that system down. Um, I put um, some smaller lines on it to slow the airflow down. I, I swapped out the pressure sensors that were going from 165 to 200, uh, dropped it down to 100, and, I think it was 130 to 145. Um, so that really reduced the amount of pressure that was in the car. And then I changed the, um, computer system program 
so that it didn't activate so often, so that when I was driving, it would react slower and, and smoother and, and really helped out the drivability of the car. Speaking of drivability, on an air system, um, the, the whole idea of it is for handling and being able to adjust the ride height. Um, adjusting the ride height for the freeway versus around town is wonderful. The look and the feel of the car when it was down low on the freeway was, was awesome. It looked great. It felt great. The handling and the maneuverability of air ride suspension is fantastic. The car handles like it's on rails. I had just a small diameter torsion bar on the front end of the car, the original uh, factory torsion bar. When it had stock in <laughs> suspension, it was sloppy. The car would really have a lot of body roll. The air ride suspension, it was solid. It was like it was on rails, no leaning, very superb control uh, through turns. So that's where the air ride suspension really shines. Now, the bad, <laughs> the really bad <laughs> part of an air ride system. It just about destroyed my car. This car was originally <laughs> supposed to be selling tool for my insurance business. Now I'm no longer at the shop and I have this car. It's a great conversation piece, but the tweaking that the air ride suspension does to this car is destroying the car. I would have never imagined how much twist on a convertible with, with air ride suspension with all the different maneuvering and things that I was doing with it and when I was showing it off that it was breaking everything loose in the car. There was a lot of hidden rust in the body of the car, in the floor of the car, in the trunk of the car, in the A pillars that was all hidden didn't know that was there until it all started to break loose. With the twisting and torquing of that suspension and twisting of the frame, the doors started to not fit right anymore. The doors, the edges started to get chipped off. So I knew there was some issues there that the front cowling of the car was moving independently of the rest of the body of the car. And in addition to that moving, I was noticing some movement in the seats. It felt like the back end of the seat had gotten soft. Well, when I pulled up the carpet, uh, a channel that ran underneath the body of the car that the seat belts mounted to and that the back of the seat mounted to, all of that ran pretty much straight across at the door pillars, the door jams where the doors closed into, that was all breaking loose. That had rusted and all the spot welds had rusted and it was all starting to break apart. Then in addition to the top of that floor where that mounted and the rust, that was starting to break all the way through. The rust had gotten just thin enough, like tissue paper, that all that metal started to break. And then under the front of the car where the A pillars came down onto the rockers, that was also breaking. The the metal, there was three or four layers of metal where all that came together and was spot welded together in the corners at the bottom of the door hinges. And that's beefed up pretty heavy for a convertible. Those had rusted enough that when the car started to get a lot of movement and a lot of torque. So now when I put the top up and I strap the top down, it pulls the back end of the car up and pulls the windshield back and jams the doors. So I have just completely made a mess of this car. My low budget car now is a body off. I have to do a full body off in order to get this car back together and, and save it. I mean, it, it's to the point of it might be junk. I might have just ruined this whole car with an air ride suspension system. Uh, it's no longer drivable. Uh, it's, it's not safe to drive anymore. With the seat not fully attached and the seat belts <laughs> possibly coming out, no, <laughs> it, it's not really safe to drive. Um, the body mounts at the back um, in the trunk at the ends of the uh, wheel wells, those are all rusted and kind of broken loose. Uh, so the only way to get the 
channel that the seat belts mount to replaced, uh, it goes up over the frame. So uh, the frame's got to be moved out of the way. So the body has to come off in order to, to fix that area. Um, inside the corners of the trunk, same thing. It's on top of the frame. So that, that's all got to be exposed to be fixed correctly. And at the same time, this is all happening and I'm starting to see the car getting all sloppy body-wise. Uh, I'm pulling into a car show. It's one of the last car shows that I went to. And I stop, I get out of the car, I smell gas. I look underneath the car and underneath the driver's seat, I've got gas dripping. So the gas line and the brake line is on top of the frame rail. And the body had chewed through the gas line. It was rusty, it was thin, but now I'm, the car is settling onto the frame and it had cut through the gas line. So I had to pull the gas line back, put in a piece of tube and some clamps so that I could drive it home because I was leaking fuel. Well, as I'm feeling the top of that frame, my brake line is also damaged. So I could lose the brakes in this car now. So this is major. <laughs> There's a lot more to it now than just body panels not fitting and seatbelts not working. Uh, there's a chance that the brakes aren't going to work now either, so uh, I'm done. <laughs> the, the, the car has got to go into the shop. It's got to go completely apart and got to address some serious rust issues and tune the suspension so that it's not tweaking a convertible so badly. Um, in the next video, I'll, I'll take you through what I found um, on this poor car. Once I got the body off, uh, it's just about two pieces. Uh, uh, right where the seat mounts and the seat belts mount, the car is completely coming apart. So Now we've got uh, some major rust repair that I'll take you through. I'll, I'll uh, show you um, <laughs> what I had to replace, what I had to repair. Um, Go through some of the types of weldings, whether it's lap welding or butt welding. Um, and I came down to, well, what do I want the car to look like? You know, do I want it to just be another driver? Do I want it to be a show car? Uh, how involved do I want to get into the car? Do I want to just put it back together and get it sold? But make sure it's safe for somebody or sell for parts. Decided to keep it. <laughs> and I got carried away and started to take it into a high-end show car. But once you have it all apart, why not? <laughs> so, Body-wise for the outside, it didn't have a whole lot of rust in the body panels, but I did end up having to do a lot of uh, work to one quarter panel with some rust and the other quarter panel ended up having to replace because it was had been caved in, it was clear full of body filler. So in the next video, we'll go through all that. So thanks for joining me on this episode of Ride Revival. Please like, share, and subscribe any support you can give me to help me keep going on these videos, I really do appreciate it. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.